Hey guys, today we're going to learn more vocabulary words with the Four Horsemen conversation. I've already created quite a few video lessons teaching vocabulary, and I hope you enjoy this one too. I mean, but actually, you brought up something which I think is is um, crucial here because it's not so much the the spread of of the raw of of, of uh, seditious truths to Islam or the rest of the world that I think we're guilty of. In the first word of the lesson is seditious. Seditious is an adjective. Seditious action motivates people to take action, to riot, to rise up against an authority figure. So he says it's not just that we are being accused of spreading these dangerous ideas in, in the eyes of, of uh, our opponents. It's the it's the not honoring of, of facts that are not easily quantified and easily discussed in, in science. I mean, you, the classic retort to, to all of us is... The classic retort, a retort is a sharp, witty comment, usually in response to an accusation. So, for instance, if your boss says, hey, you're very lazy, you're not working at all, you could say, I'm working smarter, not harder. And that would be a retort. And it typically goes with the preposition too. So let's go back and hear that word again. It's the not honoring of, of facts that are not easily quantified and easily discussed in, in science. I mean, you, the classic retort to, to all of us is, prove to me that you love your wife. I mean, as though this is a knockdown argument against atheism. You can't... As though this is a knockdown argument against atheism. A knockdown argument is an argument which is very convincing and settles that debate. Another good word to learn here is clincher. Prove it. Well... If you unpack that a little bit, you can prove it. You can demonstrate yeah, it. We know what yeah. we mean by love. It's, it, yeah. um, but there is this, this domain of the sacred that is not easily captured by science, and, and, is, and scientific discourse has really ceded it to, to religious discourse. Seed, C-E-D-E, is a verb. It means to give up the control of or the ownership of something completely. So Sam is saying that this is an area. It is a domain that we scientists have given up to religious people, to the religious discourse. Well, and artistic discourse. Yeah, which is yes. not religious necessarily. But I would argue it's not even well captured by art necessarily. There's something... Um, in the, in the same way that love is not really well captured by art, and compassion is not well. I mean, you can you can represent it in art, but it's not reducible to you don't you don't go into the museum and find compassion in its in its purest form. Um, and I think there's there's something about the way we, uh, as atheists, merely dismiss the the bogus claims of religious people. To merely dismiss the bogus claims of religious people. Bogus means false. It is a good word. It's an adjective bogus. When you dismiss that claim, you reject it. You refute it. You say no to it. To dismiss the bogus claims, the false, incorrect claims of religious people. That uh, convinces religious people that there's something we're missing. And I think this is, we have to be mm. sensitive to this. Absolutely. So it says when we dismiss those claims, it gives them the impression that we are not addressing this problem correctly that we are giving up control of this particular domain um, they, that's why they bring up um, what about the when when has secularism ever built anything like Durham Cathedral or right. Chartres or um, devotional painting or the music of Bach but I, think, I, I think guess we have, would have, we have, have answers yes. to that I think we have answers to that I mean so the counter argument which is put forth by religious people is have atheists built cathedrals or devotional art and paintings at all? Yeah, and you, yes, you we provide do. a very good answer to that. If, if, if there was secular patronage of the arts at that point, then, you know, one, we can't know that Michelangelo was actually a believer because the consequences of professing your unbelief in that case was, was death. Uh, the consequence of professing your unbelief. To profess is to announce publicly, to make bold statements about something, to make open statements about something. Hence the word professor as a noun, so professing on belief, saying that you don't, for instance, believe in any religion or you don't believe in God. So the consequences would have been dire. It would have been death back at that time. But two, if we had a secular organization uh, to commission Michelangelo, to commission Michelangelo you know, he, we would have all that secular artwork. Though do you, do you, I, I didn't actually say that the corollary held. Okay, the next word is corollary. Corollary. And you can pronounce it a couple of different ways, but that's how I pronounce it. Corollary is the result or the outcome of a previous argument. So it's kind of like what follows from a previous point naturally. Which I, I think it's true we can't know with devotional painting right. and sculpture. Mm -hmm. and that the, the patronage didn't have a lot to do with it, but 
Um, I can't hear myself saying, if only you had a secular painter, you'd have done just as good work. Oh, no, no, I think I'm using you and Richard there. I, yeah. I think I, I, I can't, I don't know why, um, and I'm quite happy to find that I don't know why. I and it's very nice to hear that Sam acknowledges that he is confused, the two of them there. I think it's a nice gesture in an argument or in a debate. It's good to be fair-minded. can't quite hear myself what, saying what, that. That, that. Michelangelo, if he'd been commissioned to do the ceiling of a museum of science, wouldn't have produced something just as wonderful. In some way, I'm reluctant to, to really? affirm yeah. that, yes. I find it... So there, <laughs> Hitchens says that he is reluctant to say that had Michelangelo been... A, of secular minded orientation he would have produced art of the same caliber of the same quality very very easy to uh, <laughs> believe yep. that that could be a difference between this. i mean with, yeah. with with devotional poetry where i do think i, I don't know very much about painting and architectural music right. but, um and some devotional architecture like say st peter's you know, i don't it couldn't be done i don't like any i don't like any way and any, and knowing that it was built by a special sale of indulgences uh, doesn't help either. Yeah, right. um, with devotional poetry, like that of, say, John Donne or George Herbert, I find it very hard to imagine that it's faked or done for a patron. I mean, yes, I people, people would be very, would be very improbable if people would write poetry right. But like could that. it be done? In so he's arguing that those people actually believed in, for instance, the existence of a deity and that their belief was genuine and authentic. Please, anyone... Mm. Well, I, I frankly think that's the only explanation. But, but in any case, what conclusion would you draw? I mean, if, if Dunn's devotional poetry is wonderful, yes. so what? I mean, it, does, it doesn't show that, it's, that it, it represents truth in any sense. Not in the least. Well, yeah. My favorite devotional poem is um, Philip Larkin's uh, Church Going, like one of the best mm -hmm. poems ever written. Right. It exactly expresses, I wish I had it here. Well, actually, I do have it here. If you like, I can read it. But uh, I wouldn't trust anyone who believed any more or any less than Larkin does when he goes to a wayside Gothic church in the English countryside. Right. Right. Who felt, I don't say believed, I shouldn't say believed, who felt any more than he does. He's an atheist. Mm. But who felt any less that there's something serious about this. All right, but and some uh, this is a fascinating conversation. <laughs> I hope you didn't get too carried away. I'll put the words with plenty of example sentences in the description for you to consolidate what you've learned in this lesson. I hope you enjoyed it.